deal with soft drink manufacturer Pepsi. The $5 million partnership was the first sponsorship deal of its kind and would form the basis of celebrity endorsements of the future. The idea was to lock Michael into a decade-long partnership that would help Pepsi challenge Coca-Cola's dominance of the market. Sadly, however, the plan was about to go very wrong. On the 27th of January, the stage was set for Michael and his brothers to perform Billie Jean as part of one of the Pepsi commercials. During filming, a pyrotechnic effect went wrong. The explosion showered Michael with sparks, setting fire to his hair. 3,000 fans watched in shock as paramedics covered his head and carried him away to hospital. He came out between these things that exploded like fireworks, and then it looked like the sparks came down on his hair, and he was shaking his head like he thought something was in his hair. And then everybody jumped on him and started squirting water on him, and he got up like he didn't know what was happening, and they took him off. As Michael began the agonizing recovery process, which included surgery to hide his scalp burns and an introduction to prescribed painkillers, his faithful fans gathered outside the hospital to wish him well. But rather than wallowing in his own troubles, Michael characteristically threw himself into caring for those less fortunate than himself. As well as donating $5 million from the Jackson's Victory Tour to charity, he co-wrote the single We Are the World with Lionel Richie to raise money for famine relief. Delving into their little black books of A-list artists, he and Lionel pulled in a who's who of the music scene. The single ended up featuring the singing talents of stars like Bruce Springsteen, Dionne Warwick, Tina Turner, Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, and Cyndi Lauper. Produced by Quincy Jones in 1985, it ended up selling more than 20 million copies and raising millions of dollars for the poor in the U.S. and Africa. Around the same time, Michael was engaged in a well-publicized battle to buy a catalog of songs by the Beatles that had come up for sale the previous year. Rumors abounded that Michael's aggressive bid had caused a rift with his old friend Paul McCartney, with whom he recorded the hits The Girl Is Mine and Say Say Say. Ironically, it had been Paul who had first put the idea of buying the music catalog in his head by telling him how much money was to be made in publishing royalties. And in actual fact, when the Northern Songs catalog came up for sale, although Paul had considered launching a late bid for the songs in league with John's widow, Yoko, he had pulled out of the race, leaving Michael to battle it out with other serious contenders in negotiations that lasted 10 months. He ended up winning the catalog at a cost of $47.5 million. As the 80s wore on, media attention began to focus on Michael's perceived eccentricities. What was really going on behind those aviator sunglasses? First, there was his pet chimp, Bubbles. Then there were reports that he slept in a hyperbaric chamber, talk of plastic surgery, and rumors he bought the bones of the elephant man. Many of the rumors were claimed to have been leaked to the press by Michael's own publicists. But despite his insistence that such stories were pure fabrications, the nickname Wacko Jacko stuck. Appearing in public hidden behind a face mask only fueled speculation about his increasingly idiosyncratic behavior, which was rumored to involve bleaching his skin. Michael hit back with claims that the marked change in his skin color was caused by the disease vitiligo, which needed to be covered up with makeup. Through all of the media's attacks, the fans just kept on coming. Swamped at public appearances and record signings, Michael Jackson had become a modern-day Pied Piper of Hamlin. And although he often felt stung by the stories in the press, he clearly reveled in the superstar status that set him apart from ordinary mortals. Michael Jackson refuses to give in to the, uh, the rumor that he is not a normal human being. He seems to kind of want people to not believe he's, he's like everybody else. And I don't think he should. Why should he? You know, apart from anything else, he's broken every sales record on earth. He has achieved things that nobody else has. So why should he just pretend to be, I don't know, a Damon Albarn from Blur? Wherever the man in the mask went, he was met with a media frenzy. And like the ringmaster in a three-ring circus, he never forgot his role as entertainer, 
and knew exactly how to work the crowd. Whether popping in to share an intimate photo opportunity with children at a local hospital, making a dash for the limo in front of the paparazzi, or entertaining his beloved fans from the roof of his hotel building, the king of pop never failed to turn on the charm. Through the years I worked with Michael, the, the greatest moment of my life was, was that moment after the show or, or a couple days after we would do a photo shoot when I would show him the bulk of the pictures and he would look at them and he would say, that's magic, that's magic. And, and this is Michael's life. It's all about magic. It's all about creating that, that magic. And there was plenty more magic to come. Back in the studio with Quincy Jones, Michael was preparing to release his seventh studio album, his first in five years. After recording 30 tracks for the new album, they cut the selection down to 11 songs and Bad hit the shelves on August the 31st, 1987. As the name suggested, Michael was adopting a tougher street image and bringing plenty of grunt to songs like Dirty Diana, Smooth Criminal, and the album's title track. In all, Michael wrote nine of the album's 11 songs, five of which struck the top of the US singles charts. To this day, Bad remains the only album ever to achieve this incredible feat. Now as popular in the UK as he was in the States, Bad went on to become the ninth biggest selling album in British history. One of the highlights on the album was the bonus track, Leave Me Alone, which made fun of the tabloid view of his private life. The video, directed by Jim Blashfield, won the Grammy Award for Best Video and an MTV Music Award. Meanwhile, Michael was preparing to take on his very first world concert tour as a solo artist. Sponsored by Pepsi, the Bad Tour took him to 15 countries over 16 months, during which he played to a total of four and a half million fans. The first entertainer to earn more than $100 million per year, Michael was becoming increasingly devoted in his responsibility as a philanthropist, donating much of his concert takings to charity and ensuring that at least 400 tickets to every U.S. concert were reserved for underprivileged children. During the tour, Michael bought the ranch in Santa Barbara, California, that would help him fulfill his dream of building his very own amusement park. Renamed Neverland after the fantasy island in the story of Peter Pan, it would become a lavish monument to his extravagantly childlike imagination. Complete with a zoo, two railroads, numerous rides, and several lakes, Michael opened Neverland up to children and their families as day visitors. The 2,676-acre property also boasted a huge floral clock. The story goes that Michael himself designed the decorative flower beds because he hated seeing dirt between them. Neverland would remain Michael's own personal fairground for the next 15 years, creating many happy memories for the friends and guests he entertained there until the police investigations of 2003. I can remember an amazing time in, in, at Neverland in, in the amusement park and uh, when Michael insisted that if I was going to shoot him on a particular ride, I had to ride the ride with him with my hands not on the bar, but, but up in the air like, like, you know, like kids would. And I thought, okay, <laughs> and I did. This, is, this will, will always be one of my fondest memories of Michael, just having fun. <laughs> in 1991, Michael was clearly still having fun as he renewed his contract with Sony. Having been declared the artist of the decade by President George Bush, he was able to command a record-breaking sum of $65 million. The same year, he released his seventh studio album, Dangerous. With Teddy Riley and Bill Bottrell on board as co-producers, it went straight to number one on the Billboard charts and became his fastest selling album ever in the US. Its lead single, Black or White, spent seven consecutive weeks on top of the singles charts, proving that Michael was still the king of pop. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the UK and Europe, the album's biggest selling single ended up being the charity anthem, Heal the World, which also became the name of the charitable foundation Michael set up in 1992. To heal the world, we must start by healing our children. 
Today, we come bearing gifts for the children of war-torn Sarajevo. In 1992, Sarajevo has become a symbol of so much that is tragic but avoidable in our world. Prejudice and ethnic hatred, the destruction of the environment, the shattering of families and of centuries-old communities. One of the Foundation's first missions was to airlift 46 tons of much-needed supplies to war-torn Sarajevo in Bosnia. Another of Michael's early ambitions for the Foundation was to institute drug and alcohol education programs. He was also one of the very first artists to draw attention to HIV-AIDS in the Third World by embarking on several high-profile visits to Africa and ended up donating all the profits from the ticket sales of his sellout Dangerous tour to his foundation. But back at home, trouble was brewing. On August the 18th, 1993, as Michael prepared to start the third leg of his tour, the Los Angeles Police Department began a criminal investigation into child abuse claims. Three days later, police arrived to search Neverland and subjected Michael to a 25-minute strip search. The media had a field day. I will say that I am particularly upset by the handling of this mass matter by the incredible, terrible mass media. At every opportunity, the media has dissected and manipulated these allegations to reach their own conclusions. I ask all of you to wait and hear the truth before you label or condemn me. Don't treat me like a criminal, because I am innocent. I have been forced to submit to a dehumanizing and humiliating examination by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department and the Los Angeles Police Department earlier this week. They were supposedly looking for any discoloration, spotting, blotches, or other evidence of a skin color disorder called vitiligo, which I have previously spoken about. The warrant also directed me to cooperate in any examination of my body by their physician to determine the condition of my skin, including whether I have vitiligo or any other skin disorder. The warrant further stated that I had no right to refuse the examination or photographs, and if I failed to cooperate with them, they would introduce that refusal at any trial as an indication of my guilt. It was the most humiliating ordeal of my life. Michael's family immediately rallied around him and called their own press conference to show their support. They were adamant that the allegations were nothing more than a cruel and obvious attempt to take advantage of Michael's fame and wealth. Their belief was backed up by a taped telephone conversation in which the child in question's father declared his intention to win big time and destroy Michael. Catherine Jackson, in particular, was unequivocal in her support of her son. I'd like to let the world know that I'm behind my son. I don't believe any of this stuff that's being written about him, because I raised him and I know him, and that's just a statement people are making. However, not everyone in the Jackson family got behind Michael. His older sister, LaToya, whom he'd neither seen nor spoken to for years, decided to open up to the press. Estranged from the rest of the family since marrying her manager, Jack Gordon, and publishing her autobiography, LaToya held a press conference in Israel and made this shocking statement. Well, I must tell you that um, this is very difficult for me, that Michael is my brother. I love him a great deal, but I cannot and I will not be a silent collaborator of his crimes against small, innocent children. And if I remain silent, then I means that I feel the guilt and the humiliation that these children are feeling, and I think it's very wrong. LaToya later retracted the statement, claiming her abusive husband had forced her to make the claims for financial gain, but the damage had been done. Putting on a brave face for fans, Michael performed in front of a crowd of 47,000 fans on his 35th birthday on the 29th of August. But behind the scenes, he was fighting chronic pain from an accident he'd sustained while on tour, 
and was so stressed out by the investigation and accompanying press invasion that there were claims he was becoming addicted to painkillers and sedatives. The next night, moments before going on stage in Singapore, Michael collapsed and to the disappointment of tens of thousands of fans, was forced to cancel the show. The next day, he was taken to hospital to undergo a brain scan. It appears that Mr. Jackson has been suffering recently from an acute vascular headaches, which unfortunately, due to the severity this evening, called the cancellation of tonight's performance. I was suddenly taken ill last night, and I am sorry for the cancellation of my performance. And I apologize for any inconvenience it might have caused my fans in Singapore. I look forward to seeing you at the stadium tomorrow. Thank you for your continued support and understanding. I love you all. Thank you. Michael's one source of consolation throughout the ordeal was his romance with Elvis Presley's daughter, Lisa Marie. Understanding the pressures of living under the intense glare of the media spotlight, Lisa Marie became his confidant and source of emotional support. During their many conversations over the phone, she ended up falling for him, and they were married in the Dominican Republic in May 1994. Lisa Marie has since revealed that during the marriage, a troubled Michael confessed his fears that he might come to the same tragic end as her father.